In this video, I'm going to show you what vectors are, why they're so crucial to understanding 3D applications, and how to use the most important vector math operations in a visual and intuitive way that I don't think you'll soon forget. I'm Jonathan Lampel with cgcookie.com, the site that's all about learning Blender, and whether you are learning Blender, or making a game in a game engine, or just doing some math homework, I made this video for you. A vector is just a set of numbers. In the context of Blender and 3D graphics, we're usually talking about a set of three numbers, one for each dimension. If you chart these three numbers on a 3D graph, you'll get a point in space. But you can also think about a vector as an arrow which points from the origin to that point in space. Both the point and the arrow are valid ways of visualizing the vector, but the arrow is going to be much more intuitive to think about. Here, I've used Blender's geometry nodes to create a mesh arrow that starts at some point and shows us the direction and length of any vector. This allows us to visualize what's happening during the different vector math operations, and actually seeing the effects in real time is what allowed me to understand what's going on, and how to put these operations to good use in geometry nodes, shaders, rigging, scripting, and so many other areas in Blender. So I really want to show you what this looks like. A lot of people shy away from using vector math operations in Blender, and I did too for a long time, because I just assumed it was for people who were more technically inclined than I was. If you feel the same, then I don't want you to think about these in terms of numbers and equations. I want you to think about it like any other tool, because I'm sure at some point in your 3D modeling journey, you had to learn what an extrusion was and an inset. But of course, you didn't have to memorize the numbers and equations behind those tools, because that would be ridiculous. You just learned how to use them. I want you to think about these vector math operations in the exact same way. If you can connect the name of the operation with what it is doing to your mesh or to your texture, that's good enough. And you can start using them intuitively right away. First, we'll talk about adding and subtracting and how that moves the point in space. Then we'll talk about using multiplication and division to scale that arrow. Then two other types of vector multiplication called the dot product and the cross product and when to use them. And lastly, I'll show some of the lesser known operations for anybody who's curious. And then we'll wrap it all up at the end with a short list of the most important things to remember. First up is addition. Let's add two vectors together. I'll create an arrow for vector A, another arrow for vector B, and then I'll add them together with a vector math node set to add. I'll use this as the vector for the third arrow. Now we can see that the result lies somewhere in between the first two. And I didn't immediately find this intuitive until we do a little trick. In math class, you might have learned that a vector has just a size and a direction. To visualize it, we have to give it some point in space to start from. In my mesh arrow nodes, all of the start points are 0, 0, 0. But we can change those to whatever we'd like. And that doesn't affect the actual vector at all. It just affects the visualization of the vector. The result of the math operation is still going to be the same. Vector A plus vector B still equals vector C. So if we can place these wherever we want, we may as well move them into whatever configuration is most helpful for understanding the result. I'll set the first one back to 0, 0, 0. But then look what happens if I start vector B at the end of vector A. I'll take vector A and use that as the start point. The resulting vector starts at the origin and then points right to the end of vector B. I can change either vector around, and this will always be the case. You can also add as many vectors as you want together, and the result will always point from the start to the end if you stack them together. One question you might have at this point is how on earth a vector can have an arbitrary location if we can also visualize it as a point in space? How can a point in space have an arbitrary location? Well, that actually gets to a fundamental idea in computer graphics, and that's that everything is relative. The vector itself, the set of three numbers, doesn't tell you anything about the starting point that it's in relation to. We can place a vector anywhere we want in the world, and it will always point in the same direction and be the same length. So the starting point and the vector are two very separate things, but we need both pieces of information in order to visualize it. The starting point for vertices is going to be the object origin. The starting point for a child object is going to be the parent object. And the starting point for any other object with no parent is just going to be the world origin. If you want to do the math here, you can just add all of the x values together, the y values together, and the z values together. But visually, addition is just stacking vectors on top of each other and taking a shortcut from the beginning to the end. Subtraction, on the other hand, is just adding the opposite of a vector. We can visualize the path by scaling the second vector to negative 1, so it points in the opposite direction. If you think about subtracting one number from another, we're really just adding the opposite of that number. And that's the same thing that we're doing here. Here's an example of adding vectors in action. Let's say that we have an instance of Melvin driving a little cart in geometry nodes, and we're animating him along a curve. 
but we don't want him to drive down the middle of the curve. We want this to be the boundary. So maybe we want him to ride just to the right of the curve. Well, you might think that we'd be able to offset Melvin a little bit to the right before we go ahead and set him to the position of the curve. The problem is if we do that, let's just give him a little bit on the X axis. This looks like it would work, but you'll see that sometimes he still is hitting the wall. And that's because we're moving Melvin over in this direction all the way along the curve. And at some points, he's still going to hit that wall, as you can see right there and right there. So to fix this, we don't want to move Melvin in the X direction. We want to move it away from the curve. We want it to look something more like this. Well, if you watch my last video on the Align Euler Devector node, you'll know that this is the normal of the curve. So let's go ahead and take Melvin's position and add the normal of the curve. I'll go ahead and get rid of this set position node because we don't need that. We can just use the first offset. So he's driving directly along the curve. And then in order to shift him over a little bit, we'll just take the position, use a vector add node, and then add the normal and plug that into the offset instead. Now, as we animate him along the curve, he's safely avoiding that barrier. But maybe we also want him to move up and down a little bit as well as the engine's rumbling. Well, to do that, we can also just add another vector. I'll go ahead and take this add node, hit shift D and move this over. And for this one, I just want to add to the Z axis. So I'll drag out and use a combine XYZ. And then we can shift him up and down along the Z axis as well. To make him rumble, I'll use a random value. And I'll set it between negative 0 0.0025 and 0 0.0025. So it's really slight. And then so that this happens every frame, let's go ahead and just input the scene time and frame. Now as we play back this animation, he's going to be rumbling up and down. Then as we animate along the curve, he's also moving up and down at the same time as he's moving along the curve. So we don't need to use a bunch of transform or set position nodes. We can just use one and add or subtract from the vector. In exactly the same way, we can move any texture around in the shader editor by adding or subtracting from its vector coordinates. Anywhere that you see vectors in Blender, adding and subtracting is going to be how you move where that arrow is pointing. Multiplication is where things get interesting. If you were to ask a math student to multiply a vector for you, they'll probably come back to you with several different answers because multiplication can mean a few different things when you're talking about sets of numbers rather than just one single number. The first one I'll talk about is the type of multiplication that scales a vector. When you scale a vector, it points in the same direction, but just gets longer or shorter. If you scale in the negative direction, it flips around. This is the exact same thing as multiplying by a single number. So we could just as well set this to multiply and input the same value for the x, y, and z axes. The scale function is just for convenience. Blender also lets you scale each axis independently if you'd like by using this multiply function. Here we can input a second vector to scale vector A along the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis. This is a direct multiplication, and this is what the equation looks like if you're curious. Scaling objects and points in the 3D view works exactly the same way. Remember how that corner vertex of our original cube was 1, 1, 1? Well, if we scale our cube, just like so, then all we need to do is multiply our vector by that exact same amount. And again, it'll point right to that vertex. So multiplying a vector is the same as scaling it. One helpful operation related to scaling is normalize. That will take any vector and set its length equal to one. So we can point this in any direction, but its length is always going to equal one. If we want to set its length to any set distance, all we need to do is normalize it first and then scale it by some factor. So if we want its length to be two meters, we can just set this to two. If we want it to be five, we can set it to five. And if we want it to be negative two, we can set it to negative two. If we want to find the length of a vector, we can just use the length node. We might use this, for example, to change the cone size, depending on how long the line is. Now, the longer the vector is, the bigger our cone is gonna be. Now let's check out an example of scaling vectors. Let's have a boo try to chase Melvin. Here I'm using the experimental geometry node simulation nodes, but all it's really doing is just compounding any change we make inside the simulation for every frame. Right now it's just moving a little bit in the y direction every frame. And so if we play this back, he'll eventually catch up. But if Melvin swerves out of the way a little bit, then the boo is still gonna go in the y direction and pass right by. So instead of moving him in the y direction, let's move him in the direction of Melvin. First, we need to get the location of where Melvin is in relation to the boo. So let's drag in that object here. 
and set it to relative because we want its location relative to this object. Now this location vector is going to look like an arrow that points from Boo to Melvin. So if we were to take this location and plug it into the offset, then we're going to have him go in the right direction, but it's going to be way too extreme. You can see he launched over there and got there in one frame. That's because the length of the vector is the entire distance between the two. So to have a move at a slower constant speed, let's go ahead and normalize that vector. Let's use a vector math node and normalize, just like so. And now he's going to move at a speed of one. That's still a little bit too fast, so let's scale this as well. Shift D, set this to scale, and let's set it to 0.1. That's a bit better. So this is going to work no matter where we move Melvin. We can move him over here, we can move him over here. Boo's always going to try to follow him. But this is only going to work if we don't move Melvin during the simulation. If we do, Boo's still going to miss. He'll try, but he'll get off track a little bit. So what we need to do is not get the vector from the object origin of Boo to Melvin. Instead, we need to get from the current position of Boo to Melvin, because those are going to be two slightly different vectors. And that one's going to update every frame. So to get Boo's current position, let's go ahead and add a position node. So now we have two vectors, the vector that points from the object origin to Melvin, and a vector that points from the object origin to the current position of Boo. But what we need is this third one that points from the current position of Boo towards Melvin. If you remember from before, the way that we complete that triangle is through addition or subtraction. But if we think about adding the vectors or stacking them on top of each other, we're going to get somewhere over here. And that's not quite right. Instead, we want to subtract one from the other. Let's say vector A is Melvin's current location according to Boo's object origin, which is its relative vector. And then let's say vector B is Boo's current location according to Boo's object origin. Well, if we subtract one from the other, then we're going to get a vector that looks like this. And if we visualize this as starting from Boo's current location, then that exactly completes the triangle, and we get a vector from Boo's current location to wherever Melvin is. So let's take the vector for Melvin and subtract the vector for Boo. And that's going to give us this third vector pointing right from the current position of Boo towards Melvin. So let's use a subtract, subtract the current position, and let's use that vector instead. Now as I move Melvin around, he can't escape. The last thing I'll do is rotate Boo so that he's always pointing towards Melvin as well. I'll use this align Euler to vector node like we talked about in the last video, and I'll just use that same vector that gets updated every frame. I'll plug that into the vector. Now as I play this back, he's always going to point towards him. We can even instance as many boos as we want, and this is always going to just work. Luckily, Melvin's pretty fast. Division in this case is just the opposite of our direct multiplication. With division, the smaller the value, the larger the result will be. As you approach zero, the scale will approach infinity, so just be careful with really small numbers. Luckily, Blender won't allow you to explode your computer by dividing by zero. Similarly, in the shader editor, multiplication and division is how you scale a texture. In short, anywhere that you see vectors in Blender, multiplication and division is how you're going to make things larger or smaller. Now that we've looked at moving and scaling things, let's look at rotation. Rotating a vector is a little bit more complicated mathematically and could be a topic for another video, but we can do it really easily in Blender with the vector rotate node. We can use this node to rotate our vector around the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, an Euler combination of all three, or if we set this to axis angle, we can rotate it around any arbitrary vector. If we use some second vector as the axis, and then increase the angle, then we can see that the result is just rotating around that arbitrary axis. Let's say that we wanted to make a vortex effect where this empty travels through this star field. Well, that can be pretty easy with the vector rotate node. Here, I'm just using the set position node, but we can't change the offset because that's going to add or subtract from the location. So let's take the position and use a vector rotate node. Then the vector that we want to rotate is its original position. So I'll drag out from this vector and just type in position. There we go. Now we're just getting the default result, but we can rotate these around. The center is set to 0, 0, 0, which is going to be the object origin. And it's rotating around the z-axis because this vector is pointing straight up. 
Well, let's go ahead and have this rotate more when it's really close to our empty. So let's set this angle based on the distance from each point to this empty. First, we need to find that vector from each point to the empty. So just like before, we need to subtract because we know that the vector for a point looks like that. Let's say to that point, and the vector for the empty looks like that. So we just need to subtract one from the other to get the vector that goes from our point to our empty. I'll bring in that empties info and set the object info to relative. And then just like before, we can use a subtract node to subtract one from the other. I'll go ahead and plug the position into the second one. And this is going to be the vector from each point to our empty. Let's use the length of that to change the angle. So I'll drag out and type in length. Then we can use this as our angle. Now, the farther away each point is, the more it's going to rotate. That's not quite the effect that we want, though, though it does look cool. Instead, we want to flip this around so that when it's really close, it rotates more, but not very much when it's really far away. So let's use a map range node to control the range. I'll plug the result into the angle, and then we just want to flip the two minimum and the two maximum. So I'll set the two minimum to one, the two maximum to zero, and now it's going to rotate more when it's really close to our empty. To set the distance that it affects, we can set the from maximum. So as I increase this, it'll affect more and more vertices. There we go. Now as we move this around, it's going to rotate. But you'll notice that the motion of the points is rotating around the object origin, because that's the center here in the vector rotate node. Instead, I want the center to be around our empty here. So I'll take that location and just plug it in as the center. That's going to be a lot more interesting. This is a pretty great effect, but I'd like it to be a little bit more extreme. So I'll move this off to the side and just increase the two minimum until I get the effect that I want. There we go, that works well. And if we want an even more interesting effect, we could change this from rotating on the Z axis. We could set it to rotate on the X axis. The Y axis. Or some combination of all of the above. There's so much more that we can do here, but I think this is good enough for an example of how to use the vector rotate node. Just remember that you're not rotating the points themselves, as in spinning them. Instead, you're rotating their location vector around whatever axis you define. So now we know how to scale things with multiplication, but I also mentioned earlier that we have a couple other types of multiplication that we can use. The two other most helpful ones are the dot product and the cross product. These are often brought up as ones that are confusing or difficult to use, but they really don't have to be. The dot product returns a single value that's useful for comparing how similar two vectors are. If two normalized vectors are pointing in the same direction, aka parallel, then the dot product is one. Here I have two arrows pointing in the same direction, and I'm using the dot product to drive the height of the third arrow. Now as I rotate the second arrow away from the first one, then that value is going to get smaller. If they're pointing in exactly opposite directions, then the dot product is going to equal negative one. And if they're directly perpendicular to each other, then that dot product is going to equal zero. If the vectors are not normalized, then the dot product can equal greater than one or less than negative one. So I generally normalize them first. This is extremely useful for finding if two things are pointing at or away from each other. In this example, I'm using the lib Super Mario 64 add-on to drop a playable Mario character into my Blender scene. So when Boo and Mario are facing towards each other, I want Boo to hide, so I'll just compare the two with a dot product. Negative one means they're facing each other, and positive one means they're facing the same direction. I can then use this information to control the speed of Boo by scaling the vector that he moves by. I can use it to switch between his hiding and his chasing geometries, and I can even store this information as a named attribute such that I can use it in the shader editor to change whether or not he's transparent. So I'm storing that information with geometry nodes and then going over to the shader editor. I'm pulling that in and using that as the alpha. And all of this can be easily controlled thanks to taking the dot product. Comparing two vectors can also be helpful in the shader editor. For example, the bevel node has a really great way of detecting edges so that it can soften them. But it would be great if we could use that edge detection for other things and not just beveling. We have the pointiness node, but that's not the same. So what we can do is compare the beveled normal with the regular normal. By taking the dot product, we can get a grayscale map of how those two are different from each other. And then if we plug that through a map range node, we can flip it around and use it as a black and white mask for all sorts of effects. The actual equation is just multiplying the x, y, and z values together and then adding the result. But all you need to know is that a dot product compares how similar two vectors are. And if you normalize the vectors first, 
the result will always be between negative 1 and positive 1. The cross product, on the other hand, is also a form of multiplication, but it returns a new vector instead of a single number. What you most need to know is that the new vector is perpendicular to the two inputs. So if vector a is along the x-axis, and vector b is along the y-axis, then the resulting vector is always going to be the z-axis. You could think of the cross product as inputting two dimensions or axes and outputting the third. As I shift these vectors around, you can see that the result will always remain perpendicular. This is especially useful when working with curves because we already have two pieces of information. We have the normal and we have the tangent, but we don't have that third axis. Here I have this animate along curve node that we built in the assemble course for our roller coaster, but I'm using it to animate Melvin along this rainbow road. As he goes along, he's going to point in the direction of the tangent, and then if I use this shift value, he'll go in the direction of the normal. But what if I wanted to move him up and down? Well, to find that, we could take the cross product. So let's tab into this node, and then just very quickly take the cross product of the tangent and the normal, just like so. And then let's add that as well, because we want this to move him. Shift D, add that in. Now we just need to be able to scale this so it doesn't add quite so much. So I'll duplicate this scale node, move that over, and then we can use this to control his height. There are always going to be two valid options for a cross product, because perpendicular to these two could be going that direction, or it could be going in that direction. So if you plug this in and you find that it's going the wrong way, just go ahead and flip the inputs, and that'll give you the opposite. You can always remember the cross product, because the result lies across the two inputs. Another helpful comparison operation is distance, which just gives you a single value that's the distance between the tips of the two arrows of the vectors. Just remember that you can place these visualizations anywhere. So even if these are two vertices that are not even in the same spot, but these are their normals or something, the distance isn't going to be the world distance between the two. It's going to be the distance of both vectors as if they're starting from the object origin. Because remember, the vectors themselves don't have a starting point. So things like distance are all calculated as if they're in the same spot. I'll also quickly run through some of the operations that are less common, but still really cool to see in action. Project is one that takes the tip of vector A and finds where along vector B it lies perpendicular to vector B. So it doesn't matter how big vector B is or whether it's facing that way or that way, the result is always going to lie somewhere along this axis. And the result is always going to make a right angle and point right up towards vector A. So we can go in the opposite direction, but we're still going to make that right triangle and just project it right down onto this axis. If it helps, you can think of vector A as the object, vector B as the floor, and then the result is going to be the shadow that the object casts on the floor. For reflect, you can think of vector A as a ray of light, and then vector B is the axis of the surface. So if we were to draw a line along that axis, the result is going to be the reflection around that normal of the surface. The angle in is always going to equal the angle out. If we switch this to refraction, then our ray of light is going to be bent instead of being reflected. In the assemble course, we talked about how we can mirror anything by scaling it to negative 1 along any axis. And that works great as long as you want to mirror it along the x, y, or the z. But with the reflect vector operation, we can actually mirror it along any arbitrary axis. So instead of this, let's go ahead and just take a set position node and reflect the original position like so, and then let's reflect it on the y-axis. But of course, we're not limited to just the y-axis. We could also change the x-axis here, or the z-axis, and mirror it across any surface or any vector. Just be sure that if you're mirroring something this way, that you flip the faces afterwards. That way, your normals will be pointed in the right direction. Face forward is an interesting one that's used for flipping something around. It works based on the dot product, which, if you remember from before, just compares two vectors to see if they're pointing the same way or not. On the face forward node, the two vectors being compared are called the incident and the reference. That's going to be these two arrows here. All you need to know is that if these two are pointing in similar directions, face forward will return the opposite of vector A. So right now both inputs are pointing in opposite directions, but if I were to move this a little bit closer, and then use the face forward, then that's just going to flip A around. And as they switch between pointing towards and away from each other, it'll flip it up and around. It's interesting, but not one I would use very often. It's also helpful to know that the mix vector node can smoothly blend between two vectors. However, you can also switch it over to color and use any of the blend modes. Since color is just a set of three numbers as well, R, G, and B, this works just as well.
Most of these blend modes are not going to be too helpful for vectors, but they can be really interesting. My favorite one to use for vectors in the shader editor is linear light. This will add two numbers if the second one is above 0.5 and subtract them if the second one is below 0.5. When it comes to arrows, it's not that useful. So let's head over to the shader editor. Here I have a checker texture that's using UV coordinates. But if I take those UV coordinates and run it through a linear light node, then I can use a noise texture to warp those coordinates. Since anything above 0.5 is going to be added and anything below 0.5 is going to be subtracted, the texture doesn't appear to shift like it does for a lot of these other blend modes. You can see here it's moving just a bit too much. But if we use linear light, then everything is stable. I can get some really cool warping and blurring effects this way. Okay, that should be plenty to get you started using vectors confidently in Blender. I know I got a little too in the weeds there at the end, and I really wouldn't worry about memorizing all of that, but here are the main points that I do want you to remember. A vector in Blender is just a set of three numbers. You can think of vectors as arrows that start at an origin and point to their XYZ coordinate. Adding is just stacking the vectors on top of each other and pointing to the end result. Adding and subtracting is generally how you move things. Multiplication and division is how you scale things. The dot product checks how similar two vectors are in the direction that they're pointing, and the cross product is the third direction that points across the first two. If you can remember those few things, you'll be well on your way. Hopefully this has been helpful. Of course, you can still use geometry nodes to some degree without knowing all these things about vector math, but even having a basic understanding of these operations is what will really help unlock its full potential for you. If that was still a little bit overwhelming though, and you'd rather ease into geometry nodes starting from scratch, then check out my full procedural modeling course called Assemble. It walks you through all of the basics, all the way up to making some pretty cool parametric structures. Check that out in the description below. Like this video if you happen to enjoy it. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.